Greetings, I'm the man behind the mask, and I would like to talk to you about hockey. Yes, let's talk about hockey, the show that journeys through the history of the sport of ice hockey from its disputed origins to the game we see today. When we last left off, clashes over control of the National Hockey Association were growing increasingly fierce, mostly because of one individual, Edward J. Livingston. The owner of the Toronto Blue Shirts, Livingston had managed to antagonize every one of his fellow owners. Eager to disassociate themselves from Livingston, but aware that the NHA's constitution wouldn't allow them to simply vote Livingston out, the NHA Board of Directors voted to suspend operations on November 22, 1917. At the same time, the other four NHA clubs met at the Windsor Hotel in Montreal and voted to create a new league, the National Hockey League. However, they didn't invite Livingston to join them, effectively leaving him in a one-team league. The new league was presided over by NHA Secretary Frank Calder, and with the exception of the Quebec Bulldogs, who had decided to suspend operations due to financial troubles, the league featured all the NHA clubs, the Ottawa Senators, the Montreal Canadiens, and the Montreal Wanderers. However, the other club owners felt it would be unthinkable not to have a team from Canada's second largest city in the NHL. They also needed a fourth team to balance out the schedule. To solve the problem, NHL President Frank Calder assigned the contracts of the Toronto Blue Shirt players to a temporary Toronto franchise to be operated by the Toronto Arena Company. Calder had ordered Livingston to sell the team, but Livingston turned down several offers. The Arena Company was then given one year to resolve the dispute or lose the franchise. The NHL began its 22-game schedule on December 19, 1917, with the Montreal Wanderers defeating Toronto 10-9 and the Montreal Canadiens defeating Ottawa 7-4. It wasn't long before disaster struck, however. Just six games into the season, on January 2, 1918, the Montreal Arena, home of both the Canadiens and the Wanderers, burnt down. Though the Canadians chose to continue their season in the tiny Jubilee rink, which only seated about 3,250 people, the owner of the struggling Wanderers decided to pull his team out of the NHL and cease operations, reducing the NHL to a three-team league. By the end of the season, the Canadians' newest team member, Joe Malone, had broken his old goal-scoring average record by scoring 44 goals in 20 games. This included two five-goal games against Ottawa and one five-goal game against Toronto. Ottawa goaltender Clint Benedict also left his mark on the league this season by instigating the NHL to adopt a new rule, similar to one already in practice in the Colored Hockey League. This rule allowed goaltenders to drop to the ice to stop shots, since Benedict ignored the old rule that prevented it so often, and the league didn't feel like charging him with a penalty and a $2 fine each time he did it. The season capped off with the Toronto club defeating the PCHA's Vancouver Millionaires in the Stanley Cup Series three games to two. Prior to the start of the following season, the NHA voted once again against playing and the other owners made plans to operate the NHL for a second season. Since Toronto had won the Cup, even more revenue was at stake and Livingston held out for $20,000, though the arena company offered him $6,000. This led to Livingston filing a lawsuit against the arena company owners. In response, instead of returning the players to Livingston or even paying Livingston, the arena company returned their temporary franchise to the NHL and immediately formed a new club, the Toronto Arena Hockey Club, popularly known as the Toronto Arenas. The new club was a separate corporation that could exist separate from any legal action. This new team was readily admitted to the NHL as a member in good standing. They also decided that only NHL teams would be allowed to play at the Arena Gardens, effectively foreclosing Livingston's effort to resurrect the NHA. 
Though now a separate corporation, the Toronto Arenas Club was not as successful this season as they had been previously. In addition, attendance for their matches was especially poor, recorded as only hundreds for a February 4, 1919 game against the Canadians. Several players had left the team, though this was partially due to the operations of the team, as most players were without legal contracts as they were really still property of the Blue Shirts and were being paid in cash. The team wrote to Calder to end the season early, and thus the season ended after each team had played only 18 games. The Toronto Arenas then officially withdrew from the league on February 20, 1919, leaving the remaining two teams, Montreal and Ottawa, to play a playoff for the league championship. After defeating Ottawa to claim the NHL championship, Montreal moved on to face the Seattle Metropolitans for the Stanley Cup. By the start of Game 5, Seattle was leading the series by a score of two games to one to one, since in Game 4, goaltenders Georges Vezina and Harry Holmes pitched shutouts for 80 minutes, causing the game to be declared a 0-0 draw. Though Montreal would win Game 5 by a score of 4-3 to three to tie the series at two games to two to one, it was not a happy day for the Canadians. In the middle of the game, Montreal forward Joe Hall was taken to the hospital, sick with the influenza virus that was plaguing the nation. Before Game 6 could be played to determine a Stanley Cup winner, many players from both teams were hospitalized with influenza, forcing the leagues to cancel the playoffs and leaving the Stanley Cup unclaimed. Then on April 5, 1919, five days after first being sent to the hospital, Joe Hall passed away. This was not the only death of a hockey great in the 1918-1919 season. Four months earlier, American-born hockey legend Hopi Baker met his end when the plane he was piloting for the French Air Service Lafayette Escadrille crashed in France shortly after the end of World War I. A collegiate star in football and hockey for Princeton, Baker was not only considered one of the greatest ice hockey players of his era, but is also regarded as the first great American hockey player. At one point, the Montreal Canadiens of the National Hockey Association offered Baker $20,000 to play three seasons with the team. He turned down the offer, though, as it was against social convention for a person of his standing to play sports for money, and instead went to work at J.P. Morgan Bank in New York City and played for the St. Nicholas Club in Manhattan, one of the top amateur ice hockey clubs in the United States. PCHA founder Lester Patrick said that Baker was the only amateur who could turn professional and be a star in the first game. Today he is honored in the form of the Hobie Baker Award, an annual award given to the top NCAA men's ice hockey player. The next season, the NHL, under the direction of Frank Calder, once again transferred the Toronto franchise, this time to the Toronto St. Patrick's Group, for a fee of $5,000. In addition to the newly dubbed Toronto St. Patrick's, the dormant Quebec Bulldogs Club finally resumed operations and joined the NHL, giving the league four teams once again. However, the Bulldogs would only last one year until they were sold to Percy Thompson of Hamilton, Ontario, prior to the start of the 1920-1921 season and renamed the Hamilton Tigers. For the 1921-1922 season, the big news came from the West Coast. Not only did the PCHA introduce the concept of the penalty shot, but also competition for the West Coast hockey fans arose in the form of the newly formed Western Canada Hockey League. A four-team league originally based in the prairies of Canada, the WCHL featured clubs from Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, and Saskatoon, and dueled the PCHA for the right to play the NHL champions for the Stanley Cup at season's end. In the 1922-1923 season, hockey would finally become the six-man-aside game we see today when the PCHA and the WCHL decided to eliminate the position of the Rover following the example set by the NHA back in 1910. Prior to this decision, during Stanley Cup matches, since the NHA and later the NHL did not play with a Rover, games would alternate between the NHA-NHL rules and the PCHA rules, allowing each team an advantage and disadvantage during games. With gameplay now more uniform between the leagues, it was much easier for spectators to follow the sport. 
This proved very beneficial on March 22, 1923, when the unique sounds of professional hockey were broadcast live over the radio airwaves for the first time ever, as famed broadcaster Foster Hewitt called the play-by-play at Toronto's Mutual Street Arena. In 1923-1924, the trophy case for the NHL expanded to include the game's first individual award, the Hart Trophy. Donated by Dr. David Hart, father of Montreal Canadiens coach Cecil Hart, the Hart Trophy is awarded every year at the end of the season to the player judged to be the most valuable in the league. The award's first recipient was Ottawa's Frank Nyber, arguably the best defensive forward in the league at the time. This original version of the Hart Trophy would last until 1960, when it was retired in the Hockey Hall of Fame and replaced with the new Hart Memorial Trophy, which is still presented today. The NHL would expand in a few more ways in 1924-1925. The first was by adding two new teams, the Montreal Maroons and the league's first ever American team, the Boston Bruins. The next was by adding another individual award to the league's trophy case in the form of the Lady Bing Trophy. Donated by Lady Bing, wife of Governor General Lord Bing, this trophy was awarded to the player who best exhibited both sportsmanlike conduct and a high level of play. Once again, the first player to be honored with this new award was Frank Nyber. Then the third way the NHL expanded this season was by increasing the length of the season from 24 games to 30. Though since the players didn't receive an increase in pay for the extra games, this decision would lead to trouble later in the season in the form of the Hamilton Tigers. The Tigers had finished the regular season at the top of the NHL and were heavily favored to win the Stanley Cup that year. However, during the rail travel back to Hamilton after the season's final game, the Tigers players went to their manager and demanded $200 pay for the six extra games they played that season or they would not play in the playoffs. The Tigers' management saying that the players' contracts stated that they were under contract from December 1st to March 30th, regardless of the number of games, refused to pay the money and passed the issue to the NHL. Thus began the first players' strike in NHL history. This one, though, would only end badly for the Tigers. NHL President Frank Calder rejected this strike argument and suspended the entire hockey club and declared that the playoff for the league title would be held between the second-place Toronto St. Patrick's and the third-place Montreal Canadiens. This all resulted in the dissolution of the Hamilton Club, after which the players' contracts were sold to reputed New York City bootlegger Bill Dwyer, and the team was moved to New York City the following season to begin playing in Madison Square Gardens as the New York Americans. While the NHL was growing in 1924-1925, the PCHA was doing just the opposite. The league was struggling financially, and when the Seattle Metropolitan's Club shut down prior to the start of the 1924-1925 season, the PCHA decided to fold, leaving the two remaining clubs from Victoria and Vancouver to join the WCHL, making it the only remaining professional West Coast Hockey League. In the 1925-1926 season, it was the same story. The NHL once again added a new team to its ranks in the form of the Pittsburgh Pirates, increased the length of the schedule from 30 games to 36, and replaced the O'Brien Trophy, which up until that time had been awarded to the NHA and later the NHL League champions, with the newly donated Prince of Wales Trophy. While on the West Coast, things were not as promising. With financial problems too great to overcome, the former WCHL, renamed the WHL prior to the start of the season, would fold following the end of the 1925-1926 season, thus leaving the Stanley Cup under the exclusive control of the NHL starting in 1926-1927. Though things were good on the NHL side during the 1925-1926 season, that year did not come without tragedy. On November 28, 1925, during a game against the Pittsburgh Pirates, Montreal Canadiens goaltender Georges Vesna collapsed in his goal area and had to leave the game during the second period. The day after the game, Vesna was diagnosed with tuberculosis and advised to return home. Four months later, on March 27, 1926, Vesna died in his hometown of Sicutimi, Quebec. With the departure of the WHL from the Stanley Cup scene, the NHL underwent even more expansion during the 1926-1927 season. Three new American teams joined the league, 
the New York Rangers, the Chicago Blackhawks, and the Detroit Cougars, formerly known as the Victoria Cougars of the WHL. In addition to the new clubs, the face of the Toronto club was changed yet again, as the St. Patrick's were sold to Hugh Aird and Con Smythe and then renamed the Toronto Maple Leafs. Now a 10-team league, the NHL decided to divide the league into two divisions, the American and the Canadian, and once again lengthened its schedule, this time to 44 games. In light of the recent death of star goaltender Georges Vesna, the Canadians' owners decided to honor him by donating the Vesna Trophy to the league to be awarded at the end of each year to the goaltender or goaltenders of the team allowing the fewest number of goals during the regular season. Ironically, it was the very man that replaced Vesna as the goaltender for the Canadians, George Hainsworth, who would win this award first. In 1927-1928, some of the final steps towards making hockey what we see today were taken. The first was the introduction of the modern goal net. This new net, designed by former star Art Ross, was used to replace the older net design used since 1900. The next change was forward passing was now allowed in the defensive zone in addition to the neutral zone. This change was made in the interest of encouraging more offensive play. However, this didn't seem to be enough, so in the 1928-1929 season, the NHL further expanded this rule to allow forward passing from the neutral zone into the offensive zone, but still not allowing forward passing in the offensive zone itself. But despite all of the rule changes to favor offensive players, the 1928-1929 season was definitely one of the best years for goaltenders. New York Americans goaltender Roy Werders would compile 13 shutouts and claim the Hart Trophy as the league MVP. Montreal Canadiens goaltender George Hainsworth would set two NHL records by amassing 22 shutouts and finishing the regular season with a goals against average of 0.92, the lowest ever recorded, also earning him his third straight Vezina Trophy and Boston Bruins goaltender Tiny Thompson would lead the league with 26 wins and go undefeated in the playoffs, leading Boston to the 1929 Stanley Cup title. On the trail of the Stanley Cup, the 1920s, much like the early 1900s, was dominated by Ottawa, thanks to star players such as Cy Denneny, Frank Nyber, and Clint Benedict, the Ottawa Senators won the Stanley Cup in 1920, 1921, 1923, and 1927, successfully making them the NHL's first dynasty. Though Ottawa won the Cup most often in the 1920s, they were not the only team to be wary of. The Montreal Canadiens, led by their top line of Howie Morenz, Ariel Joliot, and Billy Boucher, were a tough team to beat. After winning their franchise's second Stanley Cup in 1924, the Canadians were so proud that they wore special jerseys the following season in 1924-1925 to commemorate their place as world champions. But those jerseys were replaced with their old ones after they failed to repeat as champions, losing in the 1925 Stanley Cup Finals against the WCHL's Victoria Cougars. The United States also climbed back into Stanley Cup glory for the second time in the 1920s, with the New York Rangers winning in 1928, thanks in part to the breadline featuring the Cook brothers and Frank Boucher, as well as the team's coach and general manager Lester Patrick, who at age 44 inserted himself into Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Finals match against the Montreal Maroons to play goal, due to an eye injury to starting goaltender Lauren Chabot. Patrick allowed only one goal as the Rangers won the game in overtime 2-1 and ultimately went on to win the Stanley Cup. At the end of the 1928-1929 season, things seemed to be rolling forward quite well for the NHL and all were looking forward to the following season. But less than a month before the 1929-1930 NHL season opened, the stock market would crash on October 29, 1929 and the United States would begin its plunge into the Great Depression.